The following is an ICOM student media production from Brigham Young University, Idaho. In 1901, a son was born to Edward and Caroline Romney Irene in the colonies of northern Mexico. The boy, named Henry, grew up on horseback. When his prosperous family was driven from Mexico by revolution, Henry seemed fated to a life of hard scrabble farming. Fortunately, his parents had nurtured in him a love of learning and a strong work ethic. He graduated from ELA Academy and went on to the University of Arizona. By the time he was 30, he had already earned a Ph.D. from the University of California and won international recognition as a theoretical chemist. He went on to become one of the noted chemists of the 20th century. More than a quarter century after his death, Dr. Henry Irene's discoveries continued to illuminate the frontiers of scientific research. You know, we could go up to my office and I could show you modern textbooks that have been published within the last three or four years that still reference his work. There are lots of chemists over the past century or more that have done nice stuff in their day, and their achievements aren't recorded in current textbooks as frequently as his are. Though Henry was repeatedly nominated for the Nobel Prize, he never won it. Yet time has revealed the true significance of his scientific contributions. If I were to get together a room of 100 scientists, I would guarantee that 90 would know who he was. 50 would know why they knew who he was, and 100 out of 100 would know of his most major work, which was called the absolute rate theory. If I were to take that same group of 100 scientists and ask them who won the Nobel Prize in chemistry this year, I bet three might get it. I wouldn't. Henry's longtime friend and fellow University of Utah administrator, Neil A. Maxwell, often spoke of the value of having such a renowned scientist at the university. He kidded them one time that the church should maybe send a, a bill to the University of Utah uh, for a million dollars because how could they have gotten Henry Iring to come out here to the University of Utah if it hadn't been that he had an affection for the church. His prodigious work ethic notwithstanding, Henry knew how to have fun. Another thing we haven't said about Henry that I think is interesting was his delightful humor. And he never, uh, oh, it, and the humor was always against himself. He made, and people loved him for that. Henry was particularly well known for his annual foot race against his graduate students. Especially as he passed age 70, television news crews converged on the event, which promised great pageantry and amusement. Henry didn't seem to care what others thought about the spectacle. Well, I, I, I was embarrassed, you know. <laughs> Here's this, I mean, I'm now about the same age he was the last few times that he ran the foot race, and I couldn't do it now to save my immortal soul. But here he was huffing and puffing down the track, you know, on national television. Um, it was uh, weird. <laughs> and uh, he ran, the other thing that you got to understand is that he was fleet of foot. I mean, he couldn't have run a mile, but he could run for 50 yards as quick as anybody. So he was beating young guys that were working for him. Notwithstanding his never winning, Henry's foot races attracted national attention. One year, CBS sent its Sunday morning anchor, Charles Corral, to cover the race. Mr. Corral seemed to understand the deeper meaning of the competition. It's race day, weather clear, track fast, and Dr. Eyring is the clear favorite. Not the favorite to win, just the favorite. In addition to being famous for desk jumping and foot racing, 
Henry was known for the stereotypical scientist's disregard for fashion, though in this case, it was rooted partly in the poverty of his youth. Dad had, as far as I know, never, never had two pair of shoes, I don't think, that I ever saw. He would go to Europe on a lecture tour and carry only his briefcase. He'd wear a suit, one suit. He, I don't know if it's a joke, but he told me one time that he says it's wash and wear, so I stand in the shower and, 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 and you know, I don't know if it's, you know, who knows if that was true. He's, he just didn't care how he looked. And that was offensive to, I'm sure, many people, but it never worried him, you know what I mean? He didn't need to worry about how he looked. That wasn't his style. He'd go to Europe with a briefcase, and that was all he took with him on a trip that would run for a week or two, and it meant that he was washing out his shirt and his underwear every night. He probably had two sets of underwear and one or two shirts, and that was all he had. Yet while Henry couldn't stand to spend money on himself, he was generous with others, including his younger brother, Ed. One incident I remember, Henry wasn't too fussy about how he dressed, but Ed was a little more extravagant. And he wanted a $40 overcoat. Henry didn't have one, but he uh, gave the $40 to Ed so that he would have this overcoat. Remember, that's a long time ago. I'd think an overcoat that price would be quite a good one. <laughs> I recall meeting uh, one or two of his students, you know, that had been so well educated and, and encouraged by him. And I think because he was such a modest and humble man, I don't think people ever quite realized what significance it was that he was here at the University of Utah. And Neil just kept waiting for him to get the the Nobel Prize, he's just, every year you think, no, he's, he's gonna get it, he's close, you know. But, uh, so I just think he really wanted people to know how fortunate we were to have someone of his caliber and of his uh, professional abilities to, to be in our midst. And, and as I say, the humble nature of the man going out to the, to the steak farm and, and just being, mingling with everybody else, that, which is, so typical of him, but but uh, I don't think most of us really quite understood how very, very amazing and, and uh, how fortunate we were to have him in our midst. Henry Eyring died from cancer in 1981. His faith in a loving Heavenly Father never failed. He was praying and saying, uh, why, why does, why, why is it so hard? You know, it's bone, it's prostate cancer that's gone to the bone and it's terribly painful. And he said, why does God ask this of me? And, and he finally fell asleep and when he woke, he, he said he had the answer and that was, God needs men of courage. He's testing my courage. Having passed his final test of courage, Henry Eyring left this world for the better one to come. But he bequeathed to us his legacy of curiosity, simple faith, and kindness. It is a legacy that can guide us in making this world just a little better, as he did. One other kind of bonding that we ought to talk about is the ammonia bonding. We have a nitrogen and we have electrons with three protons holding the, the ammonia together, but then there's two extra electrons. And this is just like a widow with two extra children. And they see a bachelor down here, poor thing, with no family at all. And uh, the lady says to him, well, come up here and we'll share our two children together. I have the children and uh, you have the money. And so that way it works beautifully and you get the ammonia. This has been an ICOM student media production from Brigham Young University, Idaho.